Can you guys hear me? Okay, sorry about that. I have no idea what just happened. I assume this is normal. No clue. That's unfortunate. It'll be a pain to try and put these together later. Anyway. Uh, so where did I lose you? I was talking about rocks. Yeah, so I'm not a big fan of things of like overly digital effects as a result of the brushes that you're using. God damn it. Come on now. There we go. So this, this kind of brush has its place, but I just don't use it that much. Are we still good? Just checking on it. Okay, so then uh, beyond that, in the brush pack, you should find this brush right here. It looks like little birds. This is a great brush for water. Um, I use this, uh, and I think almost everybody that has this only really uses this for water. So if you have, let's say this is all dark water back here, and I pick my light, you can use it to do uh, quick hints of little waves and rivulets, you know, where the wind is picking up and it's causing a little bit of, of turbulence on the surface. It's pretty good for that, but only that. I don't use it for anything else. And the other thing is once you start, once you know these brushes, you start seeing them everywhere. There's that also. Let's see, th these are all just uh, foliage. So then here, these are my, these are the Stalin hog brushes that I built for you guys where they have a, uh... actually, no, it's not these ones, sorry. These ones are. So they have the, the little textures and shit in them. Canvas. They're not perfect, but they're they are approximation, I guess. You guys still with me? I need to make sure. Okay. I use calligraphy brushes uh, for thumbnailing. I use them for, um, I use them for all sorts of drawing stuff. When I want, uh, when I want to do like uh, more carved shapes, if I want to do hard edge stuff. The the thing about edge control is it's not just the brush itself it's the colors that you use so you can hint you can create soft edges with a hard edge brush providing that you use a, a soft gradient of colors if that makes sense excuse me Picking up color from somewhere. Hmm, I don't know. Anyway. Like I said, for, for me, really, the big key is just to use, use brushes that have a, a multitude of potential uses. And the ones that I use the most are always the ones that have the most uh, potential use. You'll find as you experiment that it's not going to be about uh, the little things that the brush can do. It'll be about how, and I mean when I say the little things, I mean the, the things that uh, the brush can mimic. It's going to be more about the, the happy accidents that the brush can deliver. 
the little the little idiosyncrasies of that brush you know like this one i love that it's a it's a flat brush it doesn't have any uh tilt to it at all there is definitely something going on with my color here are you guys seeing that too set to normal oh aha uh -huh. up here so if Sometimes this happens, like you'll hit like a, a key or something like that and it's misbehaving. The first things I'll look at are my, my layer, um, layer styles up here. Then I'll look to make sure I'm using the right tool. And then I'll look to make sure that my blending mode is correct. And it's almost always one of those things. In this case, it's uh, luminosity is a blending mode. just like accidentally bumped a button somewhere. Those little minor annoyances. I, th I really think like half of being super proficient at any particular application is just knowing how to quickly troubleshoot. That's it. <laughs> You've had, you've made these mistakes so many times that you recognize it right away and are able to suss it out. That's where I want to be with Blender. Like I'm already getting there with some things where mistakes kind of make sense. But it's interesting seeing I was watching a, a, somebody doing like hard surface modeling yesterday and he was doing a robot head or something like that and watching how quick he would work and he, same things would happen, like random shit would happen. He'd be like, what? Why is this going on? And he was able to, to know if it, was, if it was a problem that he could fix because there was just a weird setting or if he just needed to delete whatever that thing was and start from scratch. He just knew. And that's, that's really the proficiency in the app, I think. The rest is for, in our case, it's just painting skills. You know what I'm saying? Switch out the brush. If you have, this is actually a pretty interesting little uh, tidbit of knowledge. If you have an overlap that's happening like I have here with, um, with this tree, if you have an overlap of an object and the object is lost behind that overlap, it's gonna create an, a, a different kind of tangency. So I added that little bit of plant to the backside to make sure that you could tell that the plant was all the way across. Of course, in nature and in photography, you see lost objects all the time behind some behind an, behind another uh, foreground object. It's just that just happens. It's just the arrangement of things. But when you're painting, uh, it can look like it's unfinished, and, or it can look like it's you're not sure where where something is sitting in space. So either keep it completely separate from the foreground object, or better yet, completely overlap it. Of course, I did all those hand gestures from my perspective, so you may not know what I'm talking about at all. Just blabbing.
Hi, Dan Rob. I actually did think about uh, what I would do with this scene if I was just going to leave it as it is. And I think I am going to include some kind of focal thing. Which is also an answer to the previous question. Will I finish? I don't know. I don't think so. Not today. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. None of that makes any sense. doesn't chunk the computer. Yeah, you gotta guide the the view in. Um, it's a it's an opportunity with a landscape like this. Doing these kind of lead in shapes with with uh, cross textures is a great way to draw the the viewer into the scene. So you're using really big abstract shapes uh, and then texturing them according to the rules of what you've got. And it it's it's kind of a cheap but easy uh, uh, manipulative effect. Works great. I think the key with it is just to make sure that your edges don't feel super sharp so that it doesn't it's not quite too cartoony. Just a little bit. I'm still not happy with these trees. So we're going to use the trick that we talked about, the, the lighten and darken trick, in order to bypass having to select everything out. So I'll pick that color, brighten it, desaturate a little bit, like that. OK, darken it just a tad set this layer to lighten and now I can only paint on the dark stuff
It'll get harder as I get further back here because the background is also getting dark. So I got to be a little bit more careful with my brush placement, but you get the idea. I also want to do a couple of quick kind of with that color. Maybe some bounce light hints. This might have to be warm instead of cool. Just ignore the green and go for the brown of the ground. Let's try that. Let's see, whoops. Not bright enough. Too saturated. Yeah, that's better. This is tougher because everything behind this is darker. So I just have to basically paint it as I would. Ha! Wood. Um, with bounce light on trees, I tend to, again, this, these are not, this is not my forte, but with bounce light on trees, I've noticed in my own paintings, if I do it too much, uh, it makes the tree look a little too plasticky. It ends up looking um, like a birch or something more of a lighter colored bark that's highly reflective. Um, a lot of trees, especially of this kind, are pretty matte, and it's going to be more about just capturing textures on them. So even the amount of lighting that I have is probably too much. And we can always knock that down with a darker texture. And what the darker texture will do is it'll create little lines and cut-ins into the, um, the lighter value and kind of make a, a false bark texture, kind of a cheap way. If you're doing it though, you gotta be careful because if it all goes in the same way, it's kind of poopy. Ugh. Let's do another layer. When you're doing these uh, these layers of foliage going back into the background, it'll be really tempting and, and almost logical to use the same kinds of greens. But you'll find that if you use uh, the same hue of green, even though you're changing the value and the saturation a little bit, it's gonna look more flat. One of the easy ways to hint, excuse me, at, at depth with just a bunch of foliage is to change the, the hue of it slightly. So in this case, I'm making the hue much cooler for these foreground bits. And I'm gonna have them overlap this tree. I'm using big, big strokes first to kind of establish the, uh, the masses and then little strokes for details. I'm clumping. Remember we were talking about this, Irina. You want to clump. You can still have all of those details, but by clumping, you're going to have uh, a better variety of action, of the, the true shape. The, the detailing, it's kind of like hair. All those strands of hair that you're adding 
are the tertiary and quaternary details that go on top of the grander shape of, you know, like a lock of hair. You have to treat the foliage the same way. See how, okay, I'm using this brush now to kind of hint at stem action. It's the same brush, but by changing the orientation and direction of my strokes, it's giving, it's pushing those other um, leaves upwards. Now, of course, I can accentuate this further by giving them a proper bottom up to the bed. So this is a uh, plain air trick right here. I'll show you. So I'm creating a top, a top side to these masses. Let's do it again. Let's grab another color and we're going to hint at something else down here. Actually, let's not get into that just yet. I'm going to pick out some nice deep dark spots where the light really isn't reaching. I'm just kind of scribbling it in. We can get a couple purposeful details. And then this is the trick. When you're doing uh, foliage, like lower to the ground foliage, you want to do uh, the top layer, kind of hint at the light hitting on all of that. And we can go in and, you know, there's tons of different levels of detail. Right now, this is kind of mid-level detail, distant level detail that we're working with. Again, because we're going to have foreground stuff if we can get to it today. I don't even know how long we've been at this. Um, so it's not, I mean, you can definitely go deeper in the detail. But th this level, what I'm about to show you, is pretty good for mid and distance for low level. So we're going to grab a kind of a warmer, desaturated color that just needs to be just a tad brighter, not much, just a tad than that little wash that I put in back there. And then we can hint at uh, stems and things like that. And you don't want to draw them all the way up, just a little bit, little, little quick um, upward strokes, maybe even little like sideways ones that cross each other. That, in fact, that, that occasional crossing or overlapping where something kind of X's out like that can create a great deal of implied texture and and detail without having to do very much it's a great little trick and then of course if you felt brave you could go in and throw in some um some other really good yellow or green that's got some punch and call it grass this might be too much for this location, but uh, hopefully you can see what I'm getting at. By changing the shape of the stroke, changing the, the clumping of the groups of strokes, you can create a variety of, of plants or the feel of a variety of plants in a single area without having to do too much. It's worth um, just getting like a couple of different possible shapes in mind, I see. Makes sense. And in that same vein, you can also do things like, let's see, this is not in my reference, but let's go. If when you're doing your, your strokes for these kinds of details, you just kind of create like a little a rhythm and a little kind of calligraphic stroke to represent that specific thing, you can do a lot. You can hint it a lot. So you can get little bunches of flowers and things. As long as you don't mix them up. And less can be more for sure. You, you, it's not something you want to overdo a whole bunch of. And I want these to feel like they're in shadow. So I'm going to give them just a tad skylight. 
these plants. Oh, that's not it. Oh. When I get to this level of progress in a painting, does it happen to go back and change major things? Uh, no, I mean, it, it's important to have an idea in mind before you get started. But at the same time, it's equally important not to be so married to something that when it's not working, you don't just continue working on it. You want to, uh, you want to be malleable. You want to recognize when you're wasting time. So if, if the painting isn't working, if you are finding that you're struggling, things are just not, you've been working at the same part again and again for a super long amount of time and it's just not coming out for you, it might be time to go back and change something big. See how it feels like in that little clump, there's maybe like at least three different plants in there. Just just vary your strokes and use slightly different uh, colors and you can get a, a good variety of effects going on. And again, by um, changing your hues, that's too much like the hue that I had. I don't like that. That's too much like this hue right here. I want that blue up there and I didn't get the right one. So I'm gonna undo what I can and then go in now with the blue that I was after. And it'll feel like an overlap. See? Okay, uh, where to next? Let's see. <laughs> well, it, it is a kind of magic. It's trickery, that's for sure. Um, but it's everything that happened in there, there's a logic to it. And hopefully I explained it sufficiently. But that's, I mean, especially with foliage, that's one of the things I like about them is that you can be more, I don't know, expressive with it, uh, which is just something you can't do with figure work. So it's nice. It's a nice break. So now that I've done that overlap, I see more of the problems in my um, in my trees, and it's mostly see how uh, all those brush all that brush work I did on the back and just blended. There's a big there's an ambiguous value between them, which is kind of creating this like chunky bark look. You have to be clear with your edges. You can't pussyfoot with those things. So. In this case, I'm going to go back in and refine my edges for the at, le at least the outside of the trees. Cool. And it's not, it's not necessary to have like a, a hard edge, like a lasso tool edge. That's not even really the goal here. What I want is something that feels more natural and textured, but it must be a clear delineation between values. You can have a little bit of fuzz there, but the amount of fuzz I was having was unacceptable. This here is too much of, of a sharp edge. See how the value of that bush behind it is combining? This is a time when I would take just a little bit of a hint of another color or light to create a hint of overlap, just to make it clear to my viewer, okay, this is actually in front of that. It doesn't take much. Yeah, well, I'd say the the shapes are important too, but but always the most important things are the value and color.
this is meant to be the same tree, but this is closer to us and in front of uh, a larger, darker shape. Since I've created that, that bigger form, now I can go in and control my edges. And by hinting at, at the, uh, this is not the brush I wanted. I want something harder. Oh, maybe it is the one I wanted. No, huh. that's not it. <laughs> this is a... That's a delete pile brush right there. Let's stick with that one. So I did all the all the heavy lifting with the big brush and now I'm using the small brush to create the textures on top. Don't depend on the texture brush to do the heavy lifting. Never do that. Patterny. When you're uh, doing foliage like trees, it's really tempting to uh, to paint your trees throughout the entire image like I have back here where you're seeing almost like a stamp of it flat in space. You have to remember that as the trees come closer and grow larger in our perspective, you're going to be seeing them in deeper perspective, which means you're going to be seeing underneath the trees. If you treat it as like the bottom of a, of a gumdrop, right? You're going to start seeing the more of the broad side bottom of the gumdrop more of that ellipse is visible you have to do that with your trees too
big changes. You can't be afraid of doing them, even if you've got everything textured in that area. The thing I was just telling you about the gumdrop, that wasn't working right there. We need to see more of the underside of these trees. This is why we did the, the kind of blurry background is so that we could put sharp uh, features on top and have them stand out. That's why you don't want to spend a whole great deal of time painting back in the background uh, if you know that there's going to be overlap. Just enough to communicate what's there, no more. I'm not going to do this uh, sort of shadow foliage effect with all of the trees going back into the distance. I'm letting them be simpler in design. See how it pushes the other trees back? They're, they don't have the detail, they don't have the variety and value.
Same thing as we did down here, we can do with this bush. Just try and do it really quickly. <laughs> I honestly, I don't like it that much either, um, but it's a really important skill to have um, doing environment stuff. I much prefer the drama of, of figures, but um, like I said, there is something meditative about it that's, that's pretty nice. Try and find the things in it that you can like. <laughs> Treat it as a design rather than as a, uh, as a collection of an insane amount of detail that you have to do. So I'm making this gradient. I've got the dark at the top and then I'm gradating down. What this represents is at the top is all of the thicker brush in the shade. It, there's not, no light really being picked up on it. And it's at a distance where we're not giving it any great value detail per leaf. But what we can do is with that gradient now, we're implying the branch, the branch clumping below it. And then underneath that is the short brush that's collecting all that light. And then we can go in and with a lighter value, again, grab a little brush like that and imply the branches and things that are holding it up. And these little bits of details, I've got a monster hunter spider on the wall up here, or huntsman, wolf spider, whatever. You stay up there, buddy. Nobody needs to hear me screaming. Yes, although it, there is less pressure to get the anatomy on a tree because there isn't really any. There is, and you do have to have the shape language to it, but you can totally uh, push it a little bit more, and you should take advantage of that make it fun. You can even take those little that little brush value that you've established to imply that there was brush there and actually draw a brush out, just little scribbles to bring it into the plane and add legitimacy to that bullshit gradient you just made because you're totally faking it. You're lying straight through your teeth. Nope, I don't like anything I just did there. Of course, I scribbled way too much, so I can't get rid of all of it. It happens. I do want something overlapping in between this tree and this tree. Some more green, of course. It must be behind that, though. So I will grab another value. Let's do... Hmm... that one this might be too much I don't know we'll see it's always a good idea to try and experiment a little bit sometimes you can be using plant language uh, visual language right and it, the shapes you're using don't fit the rest. And I think that's what I've done here is that doesn't quite fit the color and that shape. But uh, play with it and make sure, you know, you're experimenting, but be sure that it's something that can live there. You can't go throwing in like palm fronds in this forest I've created. It just wouldn't fit. So I created the far plane. So if you think about it as a simple plane, it's almost like kind of an inverse umbrella or one big leaf. I've created the far plane with a light color and the near bottom side of the plane with a darker, more saturated color. 
and then we can just go in and, and just tighten up parts of that to, to further sell the illusion that we've created. Sorry if I already said this, but you're curious about the variation in cool, warm top lighting. Uh, no, like I said, uh, well, I don't, I guess maybe you weren't here. Um, so you want to vary your greens as each sort of bushel comes in front of the next bushel. And that includes the trees. I'm just talking about any leaf clump form. Altering the hue a little bit will give you a variety and, and imply depth. But then also you want to be mindful of the light that's being hit by direct sunlight and the light and the, the lights that are being caused by a subsurface scattering where the light is coming through the top of the leaves. So these ones I would say are probably may, maybe more hit by direct light and these ones are probably more hit by uh, subsurface scattering. And then these ones down here are not hit by direct light, but more of kind of a cool skylight. So there is there is logic to it. It's, it's not just scribbling random colors. And it helps, like, it, if you're more mindful of it ahead of time, it's going to help sell the illusion easier. All right. I think that's good enough for that plant back there. All right. Now let's see. What can we do? We've moved the detail up. Now we have kind of a pretty solid mid-ground. We're missing some opportunities over here with that same kind of scrub brush like I did down there. We can do the same thing with the trees. Kind of imply a gradient of brush. And this works both ways. You can go, the, like I did over here, I did light into a dark wash. You can also do dark into a light wash. You just have to be a little more careful with it. It's a little bit less forgiving. It can end up looking too much like a, uh, a drawing rather than a painting. When you're doing your uh, little uh, scrub details like this, you want to make sure that they also follow the rules of scale in perspective. Yeah, no problem. See how I'm making sure that that detail crosses behind? Follow through, follow through. Okay, so now I'm gonna cheat a little bit. So if I haven't been doing that all along. You know what I will do is because we are working, uh, let's see. Nope. Because we're working uh, online, I don't want to stress my computer any more than it already is. So what I'm going to do is take all of this stuff that we've been painting and all these layers, and I'm going to merge them all. It's looking, looking solid enough. It's a decent decent enough background now looks like the those distant balls will be captured into that merge but that's okay that's why we save different different versions it's a good idea always save different versions oh that's so much simpler look at that just one layer now we can go in and fuck it all up. I 
I'm going in and I'm punching uh, saturation in some parts. I'm doing this in order to create uh, little pops of visual noise that kind of grab the eye for the distance. And then we'll be pretty much done with the distance in, in this shot. All right. I always forget some part without fail. <laughs> So the way I have it right now is this distant tree is crossing in front of the foreground tree. So the easiest way to handle that is to knock that back with foliage. We are going to do the dark, um, the shadow foliage like we were doing on this side because we're looking even deeper up underneath this tree's skirt. Yeah, but it also means that because, so if this is an ellipse that we're looking at the bottom of, right? So that distant part of the ellipse is being lit too. It's not operating in a vacuum. So if you think about it, if that edge is coming out on the other side and the direction of the light is coming this way, what color should those most distant bits of leaves, leaves be? They need to be subsurface scattered, which means we need to imply that they're picking up light on the far side. Again, giving us an opportunity to create overlap in front of this, this next tree nearby. It doesn't take much either. You, this is not an effect you want to oversell. Trust me on that one. Just a little will go a long way. I'm glad you like it. Definitely. I, I hope you're the most important thing to me is that you guys are capturing the logic that I'm trying to impress to you. So you can do this yourselves. Kind of easier struggles with these a little bit because this is this is stuff I have always had a really hard time with. Sad, but true. In fact, actually, uh, a lot of this, a lot of the little foliage details uh, that I've learned and, and how to do, like some of these things I'm showing you right now, I picked up uh, from the immaculate Robert Chu. And you guys should absolutely be following him too. He's a great, great artist. Um, he did these uh awesome mech paintings way back in the day the big five series which were these cool um sort of african animals that had been that 
were the models for uh, these drones. He's got a whole story for it and everything. It's super dope. Uh, but he painted foliage so cool. And uh, I really analyzed that a lot. And a lot of this comes from how he handled it. It's good stuff. He's a really good guy. We were uh, office mates briefly. We uh, shared an office at uh, Section 9, I think it was, with Dan Luvisi and uh, Alex Konstad, Justin, Gobi Fields. It was a great time. So I want to hint at a branch coming back here but I don't want it in front of what I've just painted. So I'm gonna choose a color that's really not matching, which is this darker green. And then I'm gonna build up into it so that it can be lost in that dark green behind what I just painted, but also feels like it's still part of this tree. See, Trixie Trixie. Okay, I know I keep saying that we're done with the background, but I'm a noodle machine, that's what I do. Yeah, Robert Chu, just like that. Brilliant. He works over at... Uh, Damn, who are the guys that do, um, I'm totally spacing it, Borderlands. Gearbox, he works at Gearbox as a concept artist. Excellent, excellent dude. So of course, now that I've done that and moved some things around, I need to figure out the ground plane here. Imply some ambient occlusion. <laughs> it just takes practice. You start to see it. And once you see uh, how values behave and, and the relationships, you start to apply it, then it just kind of becomes second nature so that you're, you're not reworking the same stuff. Really, that's what this all comes down to. The skills... This, the real skill of it is just preventing yourself from reworking the same thing again and again until it feels right. Because you have the eye. Um, all of you do. You, you know when something's good. You know when something's not working. It's just about preventing making the, the, the mistakes and, and spending the time to fix them. That's the only difference between us right now. Is I've spent that time. Need a little bit of some kind of texture here. Let's see.
This is me following the reference a little bit more. I liked the ground details of this little kind of dirty path. I don't want to overdo that though. Again, I want to use this as a, is like I was using the big, big shapes to draw in. But I don't, if I make it all about that texture, then nothing feels right. The texture has to be in support of the bigger light and dark decisions in the shapes that are there. Otherwise, ain't gonna work. Uh, yeah, so bring in my brushes is right click. It's on the, the, the forward brush thing. This back one, I forget. I think it might be scroll wheel or double click. I, n I never use the back one. Um, yeah, it's been right click basically since I got on the Wacom tablet and I figured out I could do that. Well, the first time that they actually had buttons because they used to have with the original tablets, I think even before Intuos, they didn't have buttons on these. It was just a stylus and the eraser. That was it. It was a dark time, the before times. You were all too young to remember. Haunted face. Yeah, the graphire. <laughs> nice. <laughs> See how, how much time I'm spending trying to get rid of the texture? Because it's not, I don't want the texture to be the point. I don't want it to be so noisy that that's all you can look at. But I do want noise. So it's this tender game of back and forth. Give it a minute here and let it percolate. It's always a good idea to uh, stop for a second, sip your coffee, take a look at what you've done. I am uh, uh, just 40 as of March. It doesn't feel that way. I still feel like 17, which probably is not great. <laughs> It's definitely not great for my body, I can tell you that. I'm still out here trying to skateboard and shit like a dumbass. Trying to imply things like sticks on the ground and little bits of debris. Loam. I always thought that was a funny word, loam. Make a new layer. I want to bring back some of this shadow. So I need maybe even just a hard brush to make this happen. Yeah, it's a great brush. It's not, you can't use it for everything, but it has, it has a lot of practical purposes. 
if anything, I think, and it's something I always think about doing, but always forget to do with that brush is to dial down the texture power just a little bit. I think it's a little bit too textury, but that's all right. Let's turn it off and on again, see if it actually added anything. I think it kind of does. So part of the problem that I'm having with this composition, and it works in the photo, but it doesn't work in my composition, is that the path feels like it's off to the side and like we're not in the center of it. And uh, it could be just that because it's a photo, that works better. I don't know. So... And put our little love beads in a more inviting uh, positioning. Turn this off. Copy paste that action, transform that plane. something this thing has I haven't worked at this depth of the image yet but let's go ahead and do a quick detail pass in the foreground to help see if that fixes this problem because I could just this is one of those things I could be sitting here noodling all day just rearranging things trying to get it to feel like it's that inviting path but uh, one of the major features that I can't we can't bring the damn photo over I'll, I'll try and keep it on the same page I'm using two monitors, so it's hard to put it on one monitor. So you guys, could, I could just flip to it for you guys. But there's a stick kind of thing on this side, like a little dark stick shape. And I'm testing now to see if this foreground detail solves the problem of my, uh, my compositional error there, where it just doesn't feel like it's, like it's kind of inviting. And there's just like a group, there's a big kind of clump of little detail here, little rocks and stones of different colors. I'm not going to, I'm just going to approximate it and maybe can do some like, I can imply that the path is kind of tilted up here a little bit to kind of bring us back into the center of this entrance. I like the depth of the whole thing in terms of the like the little hobbit tunnel going going into the distance but the the foreground isn't doing it quite yet for me let me see if I can I don't want to do a group transform because each one of these is, is a perfect sphere. And if I group transform, it's going to change the actual shape of the sphere. Let's see if I can get rid of that.
possible to paste it over onto another layer. Oh, the the reference. Yeah, uh, I'll uh, yeah I'll find some way to get it up for you guys. Maybe I'll put it in the YouTube video or something. Yeah, especially after we just had that massive hiccup, I'm really hesitant to mess with <laughs> this stream. It's so sensitive. Whoops. See what I did there? Major oops. Wrong layer, kids. All right. They plan on adding more details to the foreground balls. No, I'm going to leave them like that. Of course I'm going to add more detail. That's the, that was always a plan. I always paint my, uh, the juicy stuff last. Right now it's, it's not important because detail that like, yes, having a focal point will help significantly to narrow down the composition of this image. The problem is, is that composition is way more than just the focal point. If you're depending on just the focal point to sell the entire composition, it's not as solid an image. So Mother Crow is a prime example of that. That last illustration I did, I wasn't worried at all about composition initially. I was just doing a focal point, which is character design. And in the end, I had to fight back and forth. So that's kind of why I wanted to show this process where I'm thinking about the overall composition first. And... I'm going to apply, there will totally be more detail. There'll be maybe a figure or something in there. I don't know yet. That's not the point. I'm setting the scene to put something in there, but the scene has to work in and of itself, if that makes sense. Just realized that my value back here on this tree is darker than anything else. It's my darkest value in the whole damn painting, just about. So I'm gonna go in real quick and maybe this will help us out a little bit too. <clears throat> Actually, before I get to an atmosphere pass, what I will do is maybe not detail, but I'm going to light a foreground feature so that we know at least the level of contrast that's going to be coming. I'm not interested in super detailed. I just need like kind of a rough idea of my intent. This is a liner brush that I'm using, but the, the actual texture on it is so juicy for metals that I use it a lot as a really large brush just to get those little kind of scratchy surface looks. Could be marble, could be could be anything. Just it's a good uh, noise generator. All right. So now that I know kind of the brightness I'm going to be dealing with, Give or take. Oops.
this kind of a screen bloom effect, you can only do it once you have your values established in the background. If you do it too soon, um, you can break your value key pretty easily and make everything look real soft and soapy. Even with this, there's a logic to the, the colors that you use, just like the trees. Something less saturated where the bloom is uh, reflected light from the sun, something more saturated where the bloom comes from a really rich color or uh, subsurface scattering. It's always too much. I always do too much because it's easier to take it away with an overall opacity change. And it's just kind of very gently unifying some values in the background. It's basically the tint that we were talking about in the earlier, uh, earlier streams. The bloom will be saturated closer to uh, light sources that have great saturation, but only just. Um, and then if it's a reflection, like let's say, what's a good example of this? All right, so if you have light coming through, like um, it has to be something, it, Bloom only works when uh, the a light source is visible in a scene. That's where bloom really, really happens. Um, beyond that, it's kind of artistic license. But your saturated bloom is going to come from places where either this, the base color of the thing that's, that is the light source, reflected light in this case, is uh, very high. Or if the bloom is around a surface that has uh, um, subsurface scattering where light is going through it as well. So then the light kind of bends around it and creates like a nice halo of rich color. Um, but the bloom, a bloom will come off of anything that's bright enough if that's the camera effect that you're going for. Too much bloom can very much be a bad thing. Um, we're using bloom here more as atmosphere than as a lighting effect. So there is a difference. It's very subtle, but, but it's important to know the difference between those two things. I am using it so that, specifically so that I can make this tree darker. That is the only real reason. Already everything felt pretty pushed back enough, but I didn't want to paint the tree darker. The alternative only is to paint the background lighter. Does it make sense? Um, yes and no. Okay. Bloom is definitely something that's going to happen more in a camera and almost always like a poorly exposed one. But uh, you can also get a bloom effect or kind of a bokeh with your eyes. And to get that to happen is when you, like late at night, if you've ever been driving or something like that, and you see the lights in the distance, if you squint at them enough so that your eyelashes kind of break up that light source and kind of cross in front of it, it'll create a little bloom around those things. Try it out, it's pretty interesting, but that's more of a bokeh effect, I think. That's the technical term for that kind of, of blur. Uh, but it, it's, it's a similar idea. And the bloom is always gonna come from the brightest things in your shot. Yeah, be very careful with bloom. Um, a lot of a lot of artists, especially if you kind of come from the more kind of manga centric um, riot splash screen kind of thing, it's very bloom heavy and it looks cool. It's super cool looking, but in terms of reality, it's not. It's more of an artistic choice thing. So bloom will generally be pretty subtle. If you put in too much, it can. I think personally, it can hurt your painting, unless it's a stylistic choice like a riot painting, which is awesome. So I'm knocking it down. 
and I'm using it again, not so much as bloom, but as atmosphere. I don't know if you guys are seeing it, but it looks like I have a soft pixel on the top of this. When I'm zoomed out, there's a little line. I hate that. It's a weird pet peeve of mine. Yes, this this that is exactly what this is. You could call this a glaze, more specifically a tint, which is a glaze that lightens instead of darkens. Uh, a gla a if you're darkening and unifying values with a darker color, that's a glaze. The unifying values with a lighter color, it's a tint. That's just painting verbiage, doesn't really matter. But because we're using a computer, we can do things that you can't do when you're painting traditionally. So a, re a proper tint traditionally, will it will lighten everything, but it can't raise the saturation of anything. If anything, all it does is desaturate because you're lightening and mixing uh, another color on top of the color that exists there. When, only when you're working in RGB can you get away with this. You see what I'm saying? I think I'm gonna let these greens just live there and not dig out the shadows of them because it's gonna create too many weird contrasts where I don't want them. I am going to bloom up this down here as this is meant to be hit by light. Probably too much, but yeah. Let's finish up this ground a little bit more and then we can figure out what the hell we're going to do for the next bit because we're almost done for today. Is an element in the background would a puddle work in this piece uh there's not really anything else in here at the hint at, at moisture um it always looks cool to add in you know to just grab like a light and then do like cool little pools or whatever it looks cool but it has to make sense with the rest of the with the rest of the scene so in order to imply that wetness, I would have to do a dark pass over everything to, to show that everything has been saturated. And uh, it's, it's something that you need to, it's not just a, an effect that you throw in willy nilly because it's cool. It's gonna, it's gonna change the entirety of the painting. Which is not to say it's not something that we could do. We could totally do that. And it would look, course. You may notice I'm dumping, um, saturation into these shadows. I'm doing that because I want to imply the bounce light in the shadows from the, the stones or balls or whatever they are. 
and I'm gonna have them be end up being a little bit more cool. It's too loud. So these, these balls, like the ones in the distance, are not lit by uh, the sun directly. But they are, in fact, in even more shadow than those distant ones. Oops. So two things will happen. One, we're not going to get the big, um, we're not going to get big directional lights on them. And two, they're not going to have deeper, sh as deep of shadows comparatively. How am I rotating the brush so fast? The brush. You mean, uh, it's set to follow right now, if that makes sense. So uh, you can have a brush. Let's go outside this. The brush that just damn it that just goes up and down or just it's aligned to the canvas itself you can have a brush that follows your stroke and that's all that that is does that make sense i think i think that's what you're asking i'm not entirely sure oops yeah Brush size is set to a, I do have a thing for that. That's my Nostromo. And the, the mouse wheel on the Nostromo is set to brush size. Good night, Arena. Thanks for hanging out for a bit. Rest well. I'll see you on the Discord. In a lot of ways, this is gonna. Th there's a lot of fun to be had just in lighting these different balls according to the lighting scenario that's available to them. So these are getting a little bit of a fill light. They're getting a little bit of the trees, um, which I should definitely be adding right now. And then they're also getting this light that's coming through the window of the trees, if you will. So it's kind of a fun challenge to try and capture the the effect of all that light on there in a place where there isn't much light at all
Do I have any favorite magic artists? Um, it's, I kind of treat like favorite art the way I treat favorite music. It, I, there aren't just like, there's, it's very rare that I have an artist where I love everything they do. The ones, the ones that, where that is the case are, are pretty rare, but I really love those artists. Um, usually it's like pieces that I like, but I can never remember the names of anything. Uh, Esper Yelsing, uh, Jesper, right? Jesper Elsing, I think. He's amazing. Uh, Jason Chan. Carla, of course, is fantastic. The problem is that there's so many that I love, and I don't know the names connected to their pieces, so it, it would sound like I'm leaving out. And that's not my intent at all. Also, I mean, the, the cast that they have for uh, artists is changing and evolving all the time. There are new artists on there. I'd never seen any of their work before and they're geniuses. And it's just, God, it's so impossible to keep up. I'm so old, I just want to rest. But it's still a fun challenge. How about you? What's, who's your favorite magic artist? I think I turned off the link bot, so you might be able to link. I don't know. You can test it and show the others your favorites. I love that Esper does all that traditionally. Like, the man is just a beast. He's so good. I'm a big fan. It's getting really hard for me to see in these shadows the glare in here. The clouds outside keep passing in front of the sun, and then I can see, and then they come, then they go away, and I can't see. I really can't render in the shadows right now. Yeah, there's just so many good artists, and there's always more. I, I do think I kind of miss, because I used to play back in the 90s pretty regularly, I do miss the variety of styles. Like now there's basically just a magic style, and uh, everybody kind of does that same uh, fantasy punk look. You know, there's less kind of goofy stuff, there's less comic-y stuff, surreal it's it's more rare to find that and those are I, I always enjoyed back in the day i always enjoyed the variety of style now they do variety like that based on the set which is cool so they're still i mean you know they know that people love that and they're still doing it which is cool yeah definitely i think that's one of the things i really dig about Jesper's style is that there is a more of a that acrylic animation feel to it it's really dope Oops. I kind of want to hint at the... This light back here, just a hint. All of this very much has to do with the last two lessons that we've talked about in Patreon. Cedric Peyravene. I don't know. I don't know his work. Link that shit up.
I'm just laying the groundwork for these spheres. Um, I may come back and light them even stronger. Oh, shit. I forgot to lock the transparency. Okay, we're good. Oh, uh, doesn't he go by a different name uh, on ArtStation or something? Oh, no, I guess not. That is his ArtStation name now. Did he have a different handle back in the day? I think I know who you're talking about. His work is amazing. He basically art directed all the uh, Dishonored stuff, right? It's just like all his style. So these reflective, reflect, reflected ground lights I've got on these are not going to stand out too much until I actually create a strong uh, cast shadow, uh, ambient shadow. So I'm going to have to go in there and do that in a minute. When you're blurring and uh, using the smudge tool on a on a layer that the pixels are locked on you have to be careful when you're blending to blend away from the center towards the edge because if you blend from the edge it's going to draw from the mask and it'll bring in lights that you don't necessarily want you see There's also the ambient occlusion that happens between objects. You got to be careful about that. All right. 
Let's work the ground plane a little bit more and seat these things properly. weird noise all right let's get these foreground guys in real quick hey hey welcome You like those? I'm leaving much more texture on these foreground ones. Again, because they are now our near our focal point. So they're going to have to have the most. I think I will imply some of that green. What time zone am I targeting? I'm not targeting a time zone at all. I'm just doing my time zone. This is noon for me. It's when I had time to do it. I'd love to make it so that it was available for everybody, but I mean, I got a lot of other work to do too. But never forget, like all of this stuff, you can watch, uh, I'm archiving everything on YouTube, so you're not going to miss out on anything. It's all there.
Sometimes my phone makes weird ass noises and I have no idea what it means. So doing uh, repeated high polished textured um, elements like this can be pretty tough to get so that they feel like they're all uniform. I've found to get to kind of fake it the easiest, it's best to make sure that your speculars are all in the right spots, that the light, like where the lights are hitting it are in the right spots, even more so than uh, texturing exactly the same and all that stuff. It's gonna be getting the point lights getting the little reflections of lights in the right spot to get them to feel like they're all the same enough. So if you have, if you have a mark on it, that's, you know, a light on it, that's here, it's got to be on that uniformly all the way across according to where it should be in relationship with the light source. It must be uniform or it'll feel off and it's really hard. Any advice on not overusing the speculars? Um, hmm. It's a good question, actually. Uh, when you're thinking about speculars, using the logic of light and color, as I've talked about in classes, can actually work against you because speculars end up kind of being an artistic choice rather than a one that you want to follow according to reason because logic would tell you to put it everywhere that it belongs but it doesn't look good if they're everywhere so a good system is to kind of make a new layer is know where your focal area is going to be so let's say our focal area is here in that area that's where I'll be really anal about speculars. And then in other areas, like in the distance or on other objects that are not front and center to what I want people to pay attention to, I'll ease up the speculars there and maybe just hint at them rather than implying that or rather than painting them wholesale. So it's a it's a tough game to play. There's going to be a little bit of back and forth, uh, but you can absolutely overdo it. <laughs> it's it's a with 
with a painting, it's more about, I mean, there are obviously, so there are painters. This, again, this is, um, it's an artistic license thing. There are painters that their entire thing is speculars and mirror reflections. I mean, look at Soriyama or uh, some of those artists that do things like the watercolors of like vintage car wheels. And you can see like the horizon line in every undulation of metal. And that's the point of the painting. Uh, in those cases, obviously, like the logic is, is vital and you must follow it because that's the actual idea. If you're painting, you know, uh, just a cool robot and you want to draw, you want to draw attention to something other than just the shininess of that thing, then it's probably best to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Curate your speculars so that they don't overwhelm your image because they can very easily. Speculars automatically create great contrast. Great contrast automatically creates a focal point. I hate this song, whatever this is, it's horrible. Go away. Oof. I think for these more foreground ones, we might imply some greater light from the actual sky and the sun. So we're going to warm it up just a tad and see how that feels. Kind of imply dappled light. Isn't the amount of speculars related to the type of light in the scene diffuse or direct from the same object? Uh, speculars have little to do with the light of the scene and everything to do with the material of the object. Um, an object that doesn't have a great deal of um, changes in the surface plane will, where it's super smooth will basically reflect the light source to your eye. So the, the point where your eye is focused on that object and the point where the light source should hit it as a hot spot in between it is where the specular will always be. That's why a specular moves when you move. Um, it's definitely more about the object's material than it is the light source itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. I'm glad you like that one. Some useful info, I think. I guess I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. You're, you're asking if uh, if a surface is reflective when there is no direct light source visible.
Oh, question. Do you guys get a notification if you're following when I'm on, when the, the stream is live? I'm not entirely sure how all that works. I've turned off all the notifications from my Twitch. I just go and watch people when I happen to be on Twitch rather than being reminded about it. Okay. So if I were to do like a, just a sudden, just one day I felt like getting on and painting a little bit, uh, you guys would be notified and be able to join. That's awesome. Okay. That's good to know. I'm going to pull this whole object in here because I'm afraid that I'm not lighting it according to the entirety of the object, I'm lighting it in terms of what is visible. And that can be really dangerous in terms of getting the light correct. I don't need to render it out. I just need to get it, get the banding in the right spots for the part that's outside. I think I definitely wasn't going down far enough with the... Oh, okay. You can set up a bot for Discord. I didn't know that. I'll uh, look into that. That would make my life a lot easier. Okay, I think everything's there now for us to get started on a figure or something like that. I will probably put in a couple of hours on this in between uh, now and the next Twitch just so that we can get a head start on at least like a sketch for whatever will be there. I'm not sure what it'll be. Um, but yeah, it'll give us just a little bit more time to get to a finish while you're watching. Which was the whole point of this whole thing anyway, huh? All right, how about that? Yeah, we'll stop there for now. Um, and we'll catch up next week and try and finish this out. I'll probably have this a little bit more worked out in terms of some cool, I don't know, figure or creature or something that kind of belongs in this scene. We'll suss it out. 
I'm not sure. I'll, I'll have to think about it, really. That's going to just take time to percolate on what could go in this, in this weird, surreal shot. Anyway, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed yourselves. I know it was much more quiet this time around, but, you know, you can ask questions of anything uh, in future. And, uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out. Hope you enjoyed yourself. As always, paint smart, paint sexy. Hi there. I'm Izzy a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're here because like they did, you wanna to learn to paint realistically for illustration or concept art. Well, worry not, you're in the right place. Grab a seat. I want you to join me as I explain all the aspects of image making in extremely digestible and clear monthly lessons. Not through the lens of silly how to paint hair or eye demos. That shit is carnival tricks. And you're not really learning anything except an exact way to render one thing in one manner. This is painting mysticism at its worst. Watching these kinds of exploitative lessons won't help you level up with your understanding. Sure, now you can paint sparkly hair, but what if you want to paint a dragon, or figure out how to render a sea of fire, or depict a one-eyed transgender space marine dying in the vacuum of space? Painting and image making are tools of communication, and can be learned by anyone willing to put in some time. Light grammar is for language. Light, color, and form literally follow a formula. Painting well is not a matter of chicken bones, zombie crackers, and the ever-dismissive concept of talent. Learning with my series, Izzy's Logic of Light and Color, will give you the tools and understanding so you can analyze light and form in reality and bring it to life in your work. Using the simple system I have distilled will help you harness your art to share your ideas as you've always intended. When we are children, we all draw in symbols. Symbols for our house, our hands, the sun, the grass, our pet lobster. As we grow into artists, we must learn to throw away symbols and begin to draw and paint what it is we actually see. And as we grow further, we learn to paint beyond what we see and what is actually there. Until finally we move beyond this and learn to trim away what is actually there so we voice only what we want. With me, you're going to have to buckle in and maybe take some pain meds. Because I'm going to rip out your normal person's eyes and replace them with a painter's eyes. I'm going to restructure how you see and how you understand what you're seeing. I'm going to turn you into a painting machine. Truly, anyone can learn to paint realistically if they can both determine what they're seeing or imagining with basic and straightforward rules. Once you understand the mechanics of light, color, and form, in reality, you will have the capacity to paint anything you can see or imagine realistically. After that, the real fun begins. Here are some of the ways you can join me and master the logic of light and color. The very first lesson of my series is totally free on my YouTube channel. In that lesson I give you the three primary rules of light that are the very foundation of painting and understanding light itself. If you do nothing else to make your painting mastery easier, at least watch this amazing little lesson. It will do more for your basic understanding of light than just about any tutorial you can find. When you're ready to get deeper and you feel like you have those first rules figured out, allow me to utterly blow your mind with the next episodes available on Gumroad and ArtStation. As we go deeper into the rules underlying the logic of light and color, I carefully and simply explain important and interesting elements. From beginner to pro, there is an amazing amount of information available. Each concept has been distilled into the clearest explanation you're likely to find anywhere. Like episode two, where we cover the atmospheric effect and how that relates to light, scale, and distance of objects in reality, and how to render it. Or episode three, where I hand over the ultimate key to controlling value in your paintings. Episodes five through eight are all about rendering materials Want to understand the logic behind rendering metal, leather, hair, transparency, damn near anything. I even cover the logic behind painting special effects like fire, neon, or lightsabers in later episodes. 
The lessons just get deeper and more detailed as I build on the foundations covered in preceding episodes. The tenth gives you the most important rule of composition you'll ever learn to keep your images interesting. The next few episodes cover important painting techniques like my edge control ninjutsu or simplification with the large to small system. We dip a toe in color theory, devote a few episodes to finishing full-blown illustrations utilizing the techniques we've learned so far. Some episodes, like the lighting game or advanced exercises one, the shirt, present cheap, valuable, and practical exercises to give you explosive growth in your development. Episodes 22 through 25 cover painting and illustration, just like I do for Magic the Gathering, from assignment and inception to signing the painting at the end. Each one is full of tips, knowledge, everything to make working as an illustrator easier. Did you enjoy learning how to paint basic materials? Metal, wood, and such? I got three whole episodes devoted to the intricate logic behind painting different kinds of skin. After that, more lessons devoted to pumping life into your portraits and original methods for accurately drawing faces out of your head. From fundamentals to photo bashing, Gumroad and ArtStation have every lesson I create available for purchase a la carte. But here's an even better way to learn with me. Stay current with my latest lessons on Patreon for the lowest price available. Monthly support gets my student that month's lesson, a critique or paint over of their finished work, a discount code for 25% off the entire Gumroad archive, and access to the Logic of Light and Color Discord community, where we plan future lessons, share knowledge, and learn together as a team. The absolute best method is to join my Patreon classroom at the Student Plus tier, where you'll get everything I just mentioned and a free episode from the archive every month to accelerate your mastery at your own pace. You've decided to take control of your painting and master Izzy's logic of light and color. Now it's up to you to choose the path that's best for you. I'll see you on the flip side. Paint smart, paint sexy. Hi there, I'm Izzy, a professional writer, concept artist, and illustrator. I've taught painting for a dozen years or so on and offline. Many of your favorite illustrators and designers have studied with me or under me and have gone on to teach in their own right. You're